Um, so uh, by 1840, um, the garyotypes are being made um, pretty literally around the world, uh, but particularly in uh, the European nations and in the United States. Um, this is the age from 1840 to 1870, that's 30 years, is the age of the hard image. And um, I'll go show you some examples of those. So that's the garyotypes, amrotypes, and ferrotypes are what we call tin types. Then overlapping with that, starting in 1860 or thereabouts, um, is the age of the paper print. So those are albumin prints and gelatin prints. These are cartes de visite, uh, cabinet cards, and stereo views. So that gives us a time frame uh, what, what we're looking at today. And that's what I'm, I'm um, going to be discussing. Um, Albert Sound Southworth was a pioneer photographer in Massachusetts, and he wrote in 1840, I have succeeded in managing the daguerreotype so as to make a perfect likeness. In a fair day, it requires three minutes sitting, and we positively know that we can have an apparatus that will not require more than 30 seconds. So as I said, a daguerreotype um, is an image on polished silver, and these are some definitions if you would like to make, take note of them, but I'll explain them um, with the next slides. Um, it has a mirror-like image. Uh, it's fragile and prone to tarnish, and thus requires a case to protect it. Uh, I made a little video here, Let's see if it works. There you go. And it, daguerreotypes are very easy to identify because they're like a mirror and they kind of disappear if you don't hold them at the right angle, sort of like a hologram does. Ambrotypes come next. It's a less expensive form of photography. It's on glass and it's backed with something black. So the, it's an actual a negative on, the, on glass. It could be clear glass. This happens to be an ambro, um, or a, sorry, an amber or a rose colored tinted uh, ambrotype. It's on rose colored glass um, and it's uh, backed by a dark backing so you can actually see the positive. Um, again, they're fragile and cases are needed for these as well. Ferrotypes, what we call tin types these days, um, cases aren't needed anymore. They're more sturdy, they hold up well. If you've ever been to an antique store, sometimes they're just tossed loose into a box. Um, and uh, the image that is here, and let me just do this. This image here doesn't, does not appear to ever have had a case. Um, and then this is an earlier image that was in a case at one time, hence the, the ornate frame that fits it into a, a case and holds glass onto the cover of it. Albumin prints, um, the, this is the first commercially viable paper print. Um, it's invented in France, hence uh, the carte de visite is one of the most popular um, and well-known types of albumin prints. Um, it was created in 1859. Um, they were made and purchased by the half dozen or the dozen. So do we all remember being in school and having your photo taken and you have all of those pictures, those multiple sizes and multiple uh, images of yourself and you traded? That's what the carte de visite started when um, these multiple images of yourself could be had. Um, enlargements and copies enabled more options for display. So uh, this image here um, of Caroline Merriam, Mer Merriam, yeah, um, is a, an albumin print um, mounted to fit into a frame somewhat like this. Um, but it's at this point in our collection, it's, it does not have a frame, but that's why it's oval in shape. And these oval frames are made mass produced um, as in the 1860s, as, a, as the years go by. Uh, gelatin prints um, are take us to the end of the 19th century um, and they move into the early 20th century. These are widely available, the paper, is coated or with a um, gelatin 
as the albumin paper is coated with egg white and, um, and then sensitized. And this is when you start finding more and more amateur photography happening. Uh, people can have um, their own uh, cameras, they send the plates away to be developed and they get images back. So um, now you're finding more candid pictures um, coming up, propping, uh, popping up if you ever looking through, um, again, antique shops, eBay, you'll find more candid shots, more relaxed as, as you see here um, into the uh, late 19th century and into the 20th century. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about the abilities and limitations of early photography. Um, there are a lot of uh, myths and misunderstandings uh, related to early photography I'd like to address um, before we move on. Um, this example is, um, it's a carte de camera. So if you wondered how they would make dozens of photographs at one time, they were taking, this camera is able to take four pictures of this, uh, at the same time at slightly different angles. Um, natural light was a prerequisite. Um, studios needed natural light. There weren't flash bulbs or any kinds of flash uh, abilities until a late, very late 19th century. So all of those old movies that you see people getting their pictures taken and the photographers holding up the little uh, T-shaped thing and it goes poof like that, that is uh, something that happens later, in very late 19th century, early 20th century. So basically a photographer's studio often is at the top of a building um, if, if you're in a city. So um, sometimes if you see um, pictures of cities, uh, streetscapes, if you see big skylights, you can, if the sign isn't already evident on the outside of the building, you can, you can probably be fairly accurate in guessing that's a photographer's studio. Um, this image is a French image, but it, it shows you all of the details of this is what I like it. Here is the skylight. So it had to be quite large. All of this, this fireplace set up the mirror, here's a balustrade and a backdrop. All of this is fake. Um, there's a, a, a floor cloth, so you could um, pretend you're walking outside on a, the piazza. Um, here you see the photographer's um, head support. There's another head support here. Um, head supports were required because of the long exposure times um, and because uh, phot photography at the time couldn't capture movement. They couldn't freeze movement. So if something moved, it was gonna be blurred just like this little baby is in this picture. Um, so that was also a limitation. You're not going to find any action shots. Um, that comes much later. Another thing that a lot of messes up a lot of people and I see some people um, describe images of people uh, in photographs as being in mourning because all of their clothes are dark, uh, but that's related more to how the color is translated in the photographic process. And I found this is a very um, helpful illustration. Um, so the middle is a regular color photograph of different pieces of fabric. Um, and I think what's, what popped out me, to me at first is what the, the fabric, the, the pieces are laying on is light blue. But if you look at the top, um, and this is using the technology that was used for amber types, tin types and, and uh, carts de visite, that blue is now sort of light gray. But if you look down here at the yellow and you go back up here, that yellow is black. The red is black. Um, you go down here in modern black and white, and you kind of get an idea of that. That's why modern black and white photos don't look old, is because they're not translating the colors the same way as the actual old processes um, did. This also affects hair and skin tone in, in photographs. Uh, I've seen it happen. If you have a ruddy complexion and you're sitting for a photo, 
you look very, very tan. So, um, and there were um, ad, uh, advice given from photographers to sitters with people who have blonde hair, for example, is to make the blonde hair white, powder the blonde hair so it reads blonde and doesn't read black um, so that you get a more realistic image of the individual. So photo uh, in photographic portraiture, and this is what most photographs were at the time, they were um, by and large of people. You do find images of cityscapes, you find images of bridges, the Niagara Falls, but by and large, if you took all of the photos taken in the 19th century in like 60 some years, most of them are gonna be portraits. And those are the images that find their ways into people's homes. Um, the very early images, and I'm saying the ones created in the 1830s, 1839, 1840, 1841, because of that long exposure time, and I'm like three minutes, a lot of still lifes were being created. It's the experimental, experimentation time. So they took pictures of things that didn't move inherently um, until they had their technique. And then by, by that early 40s, the te technological advances in the sensitizing of the plates, the quality of the light and the reflectors and the quality of the lenses used in the, in the cameras enabled the exposure time to come down drastically. Um, sometimes I've seen five seconds being used. So it's not that long. So I'm gonna, um, that said, I'm gonna, we're gonna do a little experiment here and uh, people at home, you can do it too. I'm gonna time us. So, so most of the time in the 1840s, let me just get my thing up here. They said, uh, 20 seconds to 40 seconds. So everyone, let's pretend we're getting our picture taken. Pose yourself, whichever way you want to pose. And we're going to hold it for 20 seconds. Don't move or it's going to be blurred, right? That was 20 seconds. And so, and so you see, the question of why didn't they smile comes up, right? Um, so in fact, though, the reason why they didn't smile wasn't because necessarily it was, took a long time, um, but because photographic portraits are in a direct line from painted portraits. So what they're doing is the, the photographers and the people who are getting their pictures taken, they're taking their cues from what they know and they know painted portraiture. Um, these are two or well, four portraits in our collection of the same people um, about 20 years, 20 or so, 25 years between them. Um, Cyrus and Emmeline Wade Underwood. So um, for one thing, you can kind of see how an artist interprets an individual compared to what a photograph does. Um, current scholarship, well, I, I should, well, I'll say this. Current scholarship now believes that photography did not endanger the portrait painter's livelihood. Um, there was some assumptions um, in the past, like, well, of course they did, because people would just get a picture taken. But that's not actually the case. Um, in fact, in the late 19th century, there was a resurgence in pa painted portraits amongst, again, the wealthy. But um, probably having more to do with the fact that everybody gets a, can get a picture taken, right? It's common. Let me get a portrait painted because that elevates me that much more. Um, Samuel F.B. Morse, 
most probably well known to, to most people by the invention of the telegraph. But before that, he was a portrait painter and, and he actually was one of the first proponents of photography, introducing photography in the US. So he was very excited about it um, because it, it, it would, he saw it as an aid to his painting work. He could take a picture of somebody and then refer back to it, like many um, artists today do as well. So, um, sorry, my. is not allowing me to advance my slide. Okay, there we go. Um, so another portrait convention that you see a lot in photographs um, well into the 19th century, into the late 19th century, are the use of props. Um, this portrait on the right, you can see in our new ex exhibition downstairs, you can see it in person, but you see she's standing and holding a book in her hand, um, keeping her place with her finger. Um, this image by Southworth and Hawes um, that I've taken um, from a, a book um, in my likeness taken by Joan Severa. You see another woman posed leaning on a table, again, her finger in a book to show that one, she can read, two, she is educated and she wants you to know that. Um, another example of art, artistic portraiture, um, again, this painting on the left is in our collection. It's a Girl in a Window by Harriet Caney Peel. Um, it's a copy, or I shouldn't say a copy note, an interpretation of um, an early um, painting by Rembrandt in the 1600s. Um, this was made in the, in the mid 19th century, and again, the child, the girl in the window, again appears in a, a part de visite uh, around 1870. So ad advancements, of course, technological advancements help spread photography around the country. Um, it also makes it less expensive for people to add things um, in photographs of, of themselves, of their children um, in, into their home settings. Um, these were not all necessarily just a picture, like a piece of paper or a piece of tin, but um, they were packaged in some way and merchandised. Um, by 1855 in Massachusetts, for example, this is an extent of how much photography has spread in about 15 years. Massachusetts reported in an industrial census saying that photographers there made 403,626 daguerreotypes that one year. Um, so to say that millions of photographs were made even in the first 20 years of photography is not an overstatement. Um, by 1860, the US census recorded over the country um, 3,154 photographers were working. And many of these photographers ran studios at the time they called them galleries because you could also go there and see, see their work um, and possibly see pictures of, of famous individuals. But um, they opened uh, satellite galleries in other places. Maybe he would have, or she would have a, um, a gallery in a city and maybe a small suburban or outlying town as well, um, or have partners that, uh, that would run the gallery for them. Got my cursor back. Um, some photographers took their skills on the road. Um, if you weren't close by to a, a city that you could get your photograph taken, they had what were called photographic saloons, which were actually large wagons 
that sort of looked like a boxcar on a train, but on wheels that they that had a big um, a skylight in it. And you could go to these saloons and get your photograph taken. Uh, there were floating studios, particularly on the Ohio River and on the Mississippi River, um, and photographic rail cars as well. So if, if you were in a rail hub or along a railroad, a photographer may um, hitch a, a, a car to it, a photographic car is what they called it, and um, you could visit a photographer that way. Um, again, in 1855, a reporter from Louisville, Kentucky, still considered to be sort of the backcountry, um, wrote, there is not a place of 100 inhabitants in any southern or western states that have not been visited by one to any number of itinerants. Photographers even traveled with the 49ers to California documenting the gold rush um, and the early years of San Francisco. Um, some uses for these, the, these photographs include jewelry. Um, the Garion jewelry was very popular early in its, in its heyday. Um, this is a locket in the DER collection. And as you can see by the reference, Porter, um, that is, it's very small. They made, um, there were even smaller lockets. Um, I have seen one that is about the size of an M&M for reference, um, or a Skittle if you prefer fruit flavors. Um, and uh, so these lockets, they're sometimes called watch lockets. They were mass produced in England and imported here already engraved with a design, but usually there's a cartouche that you could put um, initials in or perhaps a little um, uh, personalized engraving. Um, again, photographic jewelry, here's an elaborate bracelet with a daguerreotype in under a cover. So the cover would close and no one would see it. And if you wanted to show someone, you could open it up as, um, the technology changed, so did some of the jewelry. The, the brooch here that you see is about, it's about quarter sized as well. And uh, dates around 1870 of a little girl. It's, it's of a um, uh, albumen. So it's a paper, piece of paper photograph. So much easier to cut out uh, than a metal, um, piece of metal or um, a piece of glass, most certainly. So, um, but uh, the jewelry changed as the photography changed. So we go to stereo views. I think we're all familiar with the stereo view in that we, you hold the, or you, the viewfinder for one, if you're of that age. Uh, but the, I think almost every history museum probably has one of the basic stereo views that you, viewers that you hold and you put the paper um, or cardstock um, image and you look through it and you get a 3D effect. Well, stereo views started almost instantaneously after photography gets established. Um, what you see pictured in this advertisement is um, Southworth, Southworth and Haas in Boston built a grand parlor and gallery stereoscope. Um, incredibly, this still survives in the Museum of, of the George Eastman House, the Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York. Um, it held 12 pairs of daguerreotypes, stereo daguerreotypes that you could view by turning a crank. Um, and they charged 25 cents admission to, to see these amazing views. Or if you wanted a season pass, it was 50 cents. And yes, you had a season pass. It's, nothing's new, nothing's new. Um, but it, it's novelty, right? And um, and it offered, as we will see, an opportunity for people to vicariously visit far off places. Um, the next step in stereo views brought it into the home. And this is a masher, uh, it's called a masher's improved stereoscope. It was um, created in 1853. And this is an effort uh, by a man I, his last name I'm blanking, or first name is I'm blanking on, but he was a Philadelphia watchmaker um, who created this type of case to put the daguerreotypes in so that it acted like a stereo viewer. 
um, that you could look at and get a three-dimensional image of your loved one um, or whatever, what have you of the, of, that's pictured in the, in the case. Um, and then of course the stereo cards are what we're all used to. It's, again, millions of these have been produced over the years. Um, you can buy them individually, you can buy them by the set. Um, some photographers only specialized in stereographs and these, um, these, the cameras that were needed, of course, we saw the four lens camera at the beginning or at the mid part of my introduction. These just had two lenses that captured an image and then they created these uh, prints from them. Um, so people could visit Niagara Falls without even leaving their home. People could see the, the far off lands that are being, were being settled in the West. This, um, the top stereo view dates to 1873. So amazing uh, views for people who may not ever get too far from their homes, but they could investigate um, other locales. Uh, frames, I kind of touched on this earlier. Once we get uh, larger prints, we can have frames. Um, the frame on the right is in our collection. It's actually an ambrotype, so it's a picture on glass, um, but the frame itself is thermoplastic. Some people um, you might read call it gutta percha, but those are two different materials. Um, if you're, you've been to the dentist and you've had a root canal, they put gutta percha in your tooth. Um, it's a, a natural substance. Um, it was also used for, um, it kind of looks this way sometimes in different purposes. They would use gutta percha for um, pistol grips. Uh, but this is thermoplastic and thermoplastic is just, it's a mixture of um, sawdust and um, shellac that is plastic or malleable when hot. And then they would put them into um, a mold and pop them out. Um, and so these thermoplastic frames could be much more mass produced um, and could hold these smaller images. Um, then once images got the ability to be larger, these uh, wooden frames that you see on the, on the left here. In the, yeah. Um, these were also mass produced in, in small manufactories. There are quite a lot of them up through New England that created these oval um, frames. Some were also square, but there were a lot of oval frames for these um, uh, albumin images. Um, Again, cases, these are cases for uh, the hard images. Um, this is thermoplastic. This is a covering of embossed, either embossed leather or embossed paper over wood. And um, then the image would go on the inside and it would close up like a book. Speaking of books, then we have photo albums. Photo albums got hugely popular in 1860. As you may remember when I mentioned, uh, Carte de Visite came into being around 1859. A year later, you had to have somewhere to put all of them. So photo albums were created. These days, we don't have physical photo albums hardly anymore, but this was the beginning of them. And uh, you can see how the photos were to be arranged in the, in the albums. Um, a writer at the time, in the 1860s wrote, photographic collections are found on almost every center table, meaning center table of the parlor, a very public place. And each one is both the portrait of those who are placed therein and of the one who composed it. Because uh, photo albums not only contained your family, they contained your friends, they contained photographs, copy photographs of famous people, actresses, politicians, um, uh, at, during the Civil War, army uh, generals and colonels and soldiers. So there were a lot of uh, ways to create a photo album to be very, very personal. Um, so as, we, as I've talked about the photo album, that is really the first foray into the public sphere that you see uh, a lot of personal portraiture in photography. 
Um, another one is morning photography. And there's a lot of, I don't know if any of you keep track of or follow um, social media uh, discussions of, of morning photography or post-mortem photography. There is all of a sudden, there seems to be a huge misunderstanding on what it was and how it was done. So I just want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, here's an advertisement from 1864 of a photographer in New Hampshire saying, calls attended to with 10, within 10 or 15 miles for photographs or ambrotypes of sick or deceased persons. Um, one thing to remember, the 19th century and even before, death was not unusual. Um, what was seems to be a lifeline, so to speak, to the people who survived was to have an image of the deceased. There may be no other images of that person ever, but this image. So it was important to those people to have this image. Today, we see it more, I think, of a morbid um, custom. At the time, that was not the case. But that said, the, the photography community, the photographer, the, the, the publications that wrote or that photographers read, so there were trade publications, they were offering advice on how to take these photographs because uh, they were not trained in dealing with dead people. Um, so in 1877, a photographer from Illinois named Charlie Orr wrote to the Philadelphia Photographer Magazine Quote, place the body on a lounge or sofa, have the friends dress the head and shoulders as near as in life as possible. Roll the lounge or sofa to a bright corner because you're in their home and you don't have the skylight, right? Um, use a bolster to prop up the shoulders and position the camera at the end of the sofa. Other photographers said, no, don't do that. Take the photo from the side, not front on. So there was all this discussion. Um, again, we hear from um, Albert Southworth of Southworth and Haas. In 1847, his advertisement said, our arrangements are such that we make miniatures of children and adults instantly and of deceased persons either in our rooms or at private residences. We take great pains to have miniatures of deceased persons agreeable and satisfactory and they are often so natural as to seem, seem even to artists, in a deep sleep. They weren't intending for people to look alive in the photographs. They wanted, they knew they were dead. The people knew they were dead. That was fine with them. Current um, perceptions and, and kind of rumors and legends are being told that, that people, that bodies were propped up to get their pictures taken and that they were, oh, this is a dead person because they look weird. And that's not the case at all. Um, if you've ever watched uh, Weekend at Bernie's, you know how difficult it is to make a dead person look like it's real. Um, so this is a, one picture from our collection that is a post-mortem um, of Helen Jerusha Kingsley Hitchcock. She died February 18th, 1856. So this angle is a bit from the front angled. It seems the, the first photographer's advice was kind of followed. Again, you know, lighting is difficult because often it is in someone's home because that's where funerals are being held. So um, this was popular well into the 20th century, depending on what um, communities you are from. Many immigrant communities uh, continued this process or custom well into the 20th century. But uh, at the same time, these mourning or memorial cards were also created. Um, these were mass printed cards that a photographer could have on hand um, and then have um, a local printer uh, personalize it and then insert a photograph. Um, so that it could be passed out to loved ones and friends. Um, documentary photographs were taken and displayed. Um, the ones shown here illustrate uh, ownership of a hotel, 
in Schoharie County, New York. Um, the large tintype on the right is of a photographer in his studio. Um, right over here is his camera. So it's sort of a self-portrait in his studio. There's an extra oval frame. Um, and this image at the bottom is a daguerreotype of a young black girl, likely enslaved, most definitely enslaved, holding a white child. And this is a, this is an, a, a statement by the, the parents of this child to say that we have this individual that sole responsibility is to take care of this child and uh, this person um, is our property. Um, the information that came with this photograph told us all about the baby, but not about the young girl. And the young girl is likely 10, which is not unusual for um, children um, taking care of uh, babies at the, at the time. Um, of course, there were some humorous photographs as well. Um, there are all kinds of different, you get into a lot of different uh, kind of subgenres of photographs when you look at um, um, early photography because there are um, humor, there are spirit photos where they, they do a, a sort of an overlay of an ex exposure. So it looks like there's a ghost over in the corner. Um, there, there are other uh, uh, humorous photos, but you see this one, from the late 1890s of a, a dog. I, I like to, I'd like to think it's a trained dog and not a dead dog, <laughs> a stuffed dog, I don't know. I've seen other photos of dogs posed in this way. He has a pipe in his mouth or at least somewhere close to his mouth. Um, but I think the stick is helping him to stay up on, on his back uh, hind legs. Um, this photograph, if you look closely, uh, the men have the women's hats on and the women are holding the men's hats. See the, the right here, right here. Um, so photos in the home, how did we display those or how did people in the past display those? So we know that miniatures and many early photos were called miniatures, miniatures and silhouettes, they seem to be uh, displayed in bedrooms for the most part. Um, and early photography seems to have followed that same practice. Um, they are secured in cases that were not generally on display. You don't see images of cases standing open. Um, they were probably stored in a drawer to be taken out and admired at certain times. Um, when albums come into popularity and larger and boom and prints, that's when we start seeing them show up in parlors and other parts of the house. Um, there was a novel written in 1857 called Grandmother Lee's Portfolio, uh, written by Anne Guild, and uh, in it there is a series of letters uh, between Grandmother Lee and her granddaughter Amy, and it shows us sort of a bit about how uh, photographs were taken and how they were treated, and I'm going to pull out just a little bit of, of that exchange. Um, she, Amy describes going to the photographic studio, getting her picture taken, um, how it took three times before her sister Mabel's photograph was, was good enough to her mother's liking, um, and that those photographs were put into oval velvet cases. And I know exactly what the case they're talking about because um, I have seen them. They have different uh, velvet covers, um, green and, and red and blue. And grandmother replies, um, after she received these images they sent to her. Why, Amy, it seemed as if Mabel and you were right before me. You seem so natural and lifelike. I'm so happy. I keep them where I can look at them all the time with the cases open that your bright faces may be looking upon me constantly. And at night, when I go to bed, I stand them open on the table beside of me. There they may be the first things I shall see as I open my eyes in the morning. Um, this is a, a part of a stereo view of an interior of a study. Um, it's titled um, Study with a Dog. Um, let me turn on my little laser pointer again. So uh, this is what they're calling a dog. Um, it's a wolf, and I think it's stuffed. Um, but what, what I was looking at more particularly is um, evidence of photographs. And 
on the frame in the frames here are photographs. There's at least three that we can see. There's another one here. These are prints, some of which are based on were based on photographs as well. Um, sitting at the corner of the table here, you see it's um it might be a little difficult to see, but this is a photo album. Um, they had very thick or they have very thick uh, pages. And once they're filled with photos, they tend to, to spring open. And they had these uh, latches on the um, edges to help keep them closed. But sometimes that's not even possible because they're so full. Um, so it has a, a, a distinctive um, look to them. Um, so this was from the 1850s, this image. This is image from Taunton, Massachusetts in 1875. A very simple house. If you look at the house in the interior first, you'll see that the this ceiling is very low and actually has exposed beams, which means that it, there's no plaster. The walls are board. Again, very simple, no wallpaper. Um, the chairs are really quite basic, two folding chairs. There is a sofa over here, but what do you see here? Here's a photo, here's a photo, these are photos, that's a photo, this is a photo album, as well as this is a photo album. So simple home, They're, this is their best room, it's their parlor, so it has more things to show, but again, they have photos on display. So in conclusion, uh, as we follow the popularity of photography into the 20th century, you see an explosion of uh, pictures. Uh, this is Mary Flaherty's bedroom in Helena, Montana. Um, and all over the walls are photographs. And over here is a photograph. So um, this is, that she's a student. As you can see, there are pennants over here. Um, you can just barely see them, but um, she's a student. These are her friends. She's showing them off. She doesn't care if she's got a hole through them. She's sticking them up on the wall. Um, these images are a way that, I mean, she's a student, right? She doesn't have any money. She's living at home, um, but she has a lot of photographs. And um, so this is a way that anybody, anybody who would like their picture taken, unless you were completely destitute, you could afford to have your photo taken at least by the 1860s, if not before. So that means we have an unprecedented re record of people um, who lived not only in the United States, but around the world. Um, that's a whole other discussion, how photography just spread all over the place. Um, there, are, there are photographs from J Japan and South America and Australia and, and Africa, so uh, during this period. So it is a, it's an amazing uh, way to look at history and to um, learn a little bit more of the customs of uh, the human past that we may have overlooked um, otherwise. So thank you very much. We have a couple questions from online. Uh, the first question is, can damage to tintype photos be repaired? Oh, I'm not, I'm not a con uh, conservator. Um, I guess it would depend on what kind of damage it is. Tintypes are prone to rust is the, the kind of, because it's iron, uh, it's prone to rust. I don't know what kind of damage if it's, um, some people what they've done is scan the tintype and then Photoshop the repair, but I've not seen that there, there is a way to com, conscientiously repair it. Next question is, I've seen lots of photos from the early 1900s of friends slash family where they were cut out of a picture, uh, parentheses absent background, and put that in an album. How did this become a popular method of preserving a photo cutout? That's interesting. Uh, I'm thinking what the question is, is that they cut the people out and took the background away and put it in an album. Um, actually, that custom starts around the time ambrotypes come along. There's a 
type of photograph called a relievo amber type, where a photo is taken, amber type made, and what that image is is an emulsion. It's 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 physical. It's on the glass, and so the photographer scrapes the background away, and uh, when it's put into a case, it tends to look a little bit three dimensional. Um, sometimes they'll put fancy backings, uh, like um, some I've seen, like a glitter coated background. It's pretty <laughs> woo woo, uh, but uh, but those are kind of rare. But I think that's sort of the same thing. It's just a way. It's it's like an early Photoshop. It's a way to like here are the people, but I'm putting them over here. Yeah. All right, the double exposure ghost uh, was not always a joke. For example, Mary Lincoln was misled by a photographer who showed her a ghost image of her deceased husband. In your research, have you found any photographs of photographers promising such encounters with the deceased? That's a, that's a good question. I have not seen a, a evident like crossover between spiritualism and photography there are it's called spirit photography and there are people saying you know I may, I'm doing spirit pho photographs I think most people believed that they weren't real um of course you you choose vulnerable people if if you're going to try and get something over on on an individual that's unfortunate I've not seen um evidence of others actually saying that they can commune with the dead. Spiritualism was a huge thing starting around 1840s um, in the 19th century, seances and, and trying to talk to the dead. Again, because mortality was right there next to you, um, uh, so more so than, than today. So that was a way that people were trying to, to, to talk to loved ones. Last question from online. Will you do a talk on street photography at some point? I am particularly curious about the 1940s or so when photographers would do candid shots of random people on the streets shopping. Oh, wow. Yeah, I love street photography. It's, it's really fun. My expertise is 19th century photography. So that in the 1940s is sort of out of my realm. I appreciate it. And I love Margaret Bork White and other photographers, Ansel Adams and, and other early 20th century photographers. But it's not, it's not my area of expertise. But street photography is amazing. And in the 19th century, there was a type of street photography. Of course, you couldn't catch it couldn't be candid because it had to be posed, but there are images of people outside of their homes, outside of their workplaces uh, posed. Um, sometimes the, you do have blurred people because they're just walking across and they didn't know pictures being taken. Um, but that's a, a, an interesting type of street photography. One of the very first uh, images of an African-American actually was um, captured in Baltimore because he was on the street um, when a photographer was taking a picture of a block. And it was a long exposure, so he's somewhat blurred. But um, I think that is in the collection of Ross Kelbaugh, if I believe I'm correct. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, so the limitations of 19th century street photography are, are real, but um, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to, I look, I look for the everyday things in street photography. Fine. Um, any tips for telling the difference between a gelatin and an albumin print? Um, that's a little hard. Um, time frame, format, like um, many gelatin prints are different shapes. Very, uh, a, a number of them are square, uh, but both gelatin and albumins tend to silver. So um, as they age, there's the blacks and the grays tend to start looking shiny and silver. So it, it is very difficult um, to say, but uh, look at the, the type of mount and the, the general age um, of the people in the, the, the picture. Like, what are they wearing? Is it, is it a, something taken at the time that gelatin was replacing albumin, then you know. Early 20th century, it most likely was gelatin. During this period, I was curious, was there uh, color photography possible or did that have to come later? 
Uh, well, actually, that was a, a fascinating question that almost from the beginning, photographers were trying to tackle. Color photography, we want to color photography. And there are, it really wasn't a practical until the 20th century. Um, early efforts were hand colored photographs and uh, different ways to manipulate the chemicals that sensitize the, and, and, and develop the picture. Um, there was, they learned early on solarization, which is an overexposure of the plate of like, if I were getting my picture taken, this could be bright blue because of the way the light is being bounced off of the white. Um, so they tried to use that sometimes, but hand coloring was the way to kind of solve that mystery until like the turn of the 20th century. 19th turn of the 20th century um yeah there they but it, people were writing about it oh we've done it we found it we did it and it's like no you didn't because it didn't last and and but and then there are colorists who were artists in their own right so they some were very very good um and some were very very bad and there were kits that you could buy if you had an albumin um, print like a, a, a carte de visite that you would like to have colored. You could buy a kit. Um, I saw an ad for one in Godey's Ladies Book, um, popular women's magazine in the 19th century. You could buy this kit to color your own photographs. And I think um, I've seen some of those because they're really not good. Uh, <laughs> but some of the color photographs, uh, some of the early daguerreotypes that are colored are amazing. Um, I didn't mention in this lecture, I mentioned in my dating historic photographs lecture about how detailed um, the garyotypes are. They are so clear um, and you could count hairs on people's heads. You can, it's, they, as the technology progressed and got more faster and, and, and more widespread, the quality went down. And um, I've read, I haven't done the, the research, but I have read that it's only recently with the advent of some digital cameras that they can approach the clarity of daguerreotypes. So it's a case of old isn't necessarily inferior. So that's a long answer to your question.